Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast. This is episode 251. My friend Dan Held rejoins me on the show, and we're talking about HODL mindsets versus spending and mistakes made along the way. So there's a lot of value in this episode, both for new Bitcoiners and experienced Bitcoiners in terms of how to think about when you should spend, when you shouldn't, and Bitcoin finances. This show brought to you by swanbitcoin.com. Swan is the fastest way from zero to Bitcoin. I've been friends with the guys for a while. They've created an excellent experience for new Bitcoiners. It's really easy sign up. There's no altcoins. It's really cheap. They're available in all states in the US. You can set up a recurring purchase plan and Swan supports bank wires for larger amounts and ACH transfers for smaller one-time buys also. With Swan Bitcoin, there's definitely a focus on education. So make sure you send your new coiner friends there, or if you're new yourself, you can go there. Send them to swanbitcoin.com slash levera, and Swan will drop $10 of free Bitcoin in your account when you become a member. Unchained Capital are building Bitcoin native financial services. And we talk about this in the episode as well. So they're providing multi-signature vaults and also a loaned product. So if you're thinking about your security, if the number of your coins has gone up, start thinking about using multi-signature. So Unchained Capital offer a concierge service. So as part of the service, they ship you two hardware wallets, they answer your questions, they do Zoom calls with you, and they deposit $1,000 of Bitcoin in your vault. So normally it's $1,500, but if you use my code Levera, you get $50 off. So Unchained Capital are great if you're thinking about buying through OTC or using it for self-directed Bitcoin retirement accounts. They also offer advanced business accounts. So there's a whole range of features and also educational content on their website also. So go to unchained-capital.com. Compass is an online marketplace which makes it easier for everyone to mine Bitcoin and enhance the Bitcoin network's security. They are the anti-cloud mining option. Compass helps you buy your own ASIC and secure hosting at great facilities around the world. For years, we've all heard that mining is only profitable if you're investing tons of money. But now with Compass, everyone is able to tap into economies of scale and access reasonably priced hardware and cheap industrial power rates. And if you're unsure about how to get started with mining Bitcoin, Compass offers hardware and hosting bundles, which eliminates the need for advanced technical knowledge and allows you to quickly get started mining Bitcoin with hardware that you own. Visit them at minewithcompass.com and start mining Bitcoin today. Here's the show. Dan, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been, a, it's been a little while. Exactly, man. And it has been crazy. The last few weeks, we've had Elon and Tesla buying one and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin. We had a price pump just to around 47,000 USD. As we speak right now, it's around 44,000. What's your take just on the recent few weeks? Well, you know, I think it feels like it's been such a long time because in Bitcoin years with all this price volatility, it, it definitely ages us. You know, it's <laughs> it, it's interesting. My my girlfriend noticed some gray, uh, gray hairs on my chin and uh, I'm 32 years old. So that's a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's been it's been wild. I mean, I've been in this space for eight years, seeing institutions, seeing big corporations come in and buy Bitcoin with their treasury. This is what I've been waiting for. This is incredible. I mean, this is validation that Bitcoin is a global store of value asset. It, it, it's Honestly, it's mind blowing. Like it still really hasn't sunk in for me how big of a deal this is. I think like my brother and my parents and, and they, they're they not very into Bitcoin despite being a, a relative of mine. You know, for them, it was, it was always Dan's got his weird Bitcoin thing. And, you know, as a Bitcoin, it's kind of an isolating sort of feeling right of like you you see this future and you're somewhat tortured by it as you're the only one who gets it but now i'm seeing not only family members but like old middle school high school college friends they're all starting to come out of the woodwork and go like oh it finally makes sense now they're not just going hey should i buy bitcoin for like the speculative sort of reason like hey should i buy, should i get in now they're more of like i get it dude like i finally get the message i get why bitcoin's useful um so this is i think really exciting time to be in bitcoin of course. And I think this is one of those things when people are a little bit newer, they haven't had that time to build their conviction. So I think that's a really good theme and topic to discuss is just this whole hodl mindset, a hodl philosophy, whatever you want to call it. How people, um, how do you think people should build their hodl conviction? That's a great question. 
So um, first to clear things up, my last name is actually my real last name. I didn't make that up. <laughs> I think a lot of people think uh, Held is a made up last name. It, it is my real last name. You were born to do this, Dan. I think so. It's like blacksmith <laughs> with the Smith last name. You know, it's like your your last name is your profession. I think I was born to hodl, man. So no, it's my real last name. It's a German last name. You know, what's funny is I no no one's a perfect hodler. Like I, I think a lot of people go in and they see uh, folks like myself and others and they're like, oh, Dan must have been a perfect hodler the whole time. No, man, I'm a human. Like, like in the beginning, I tried to day trade a little bit poorly. <laughs> I didn't do very well. Um, I also traded Litecoin. I mined Prime Coin. You know, I explored around the alts a little bit. You know, this is back 13, 14, 15. So like no one's a perfect hodler. People typically go explore and try things and think they're smarter than the market, which you're not. And, um, you know, that these these experiences of, of pain and feeling, you know, making mistakes is how you learn. This is how you learn in your <clears throat> in the traditional world with relationships, work, and, and just learning in general. So so with Bitcoin and hodling, it's typically not a, a, a very, you know, 100% pure hodling experience. You usually learn through some mistakes that you've made. But what's nice is that you can hear about my mistakes and Stefan's mistakes and other people's mistakes and take all those together and and hopefully learn from it and, and hopefully avoid what we did. So, you know, when it comes to hodling, I think a really important mindset to have is a basic investing mindset of, you know, when you buy something, plan to hodl it for five to 10 years. I don't care if you're buying a house or a car or or, um, you know, stock or Bitcoin, <clears throat> that investment philosophy, and this is why, you know, I think we're going to touch on later, hodling is a, is a philosophy. You know, this, these are, you know, these are important. Uh, this is an important mindset to have is, is you're convicted in the trade. You're convicted in utilizing the asset over a long period of time or investing in something for a long period of time. And when it comes to Bitcoin hodling, you really just have to divorce yourself from the emotion of those day-to-day -day swings. Am I mentally impacted by the day-to-day -day swings? Yes, but I'm so divorced from it by now to where it's numbers for me, right? It's not really like a, I'm not, I'm not looking at the numbers and I'm like, oh, I can go buy something or I could buy this or that, or, oh no, I lost this or that. I don't feel that way about it. For me, it's just more of like a scoreboard where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm more right on my investment thesis. So I, I think that you know, that's a very important element of, of a HODL mindset is the classic investor's mindset of long-term investing, I think is definitely a pillar of that. Of course. And a common thing that I hear when I talk to more new people Bitcoiners is they they come to me and say stuff like oh is now a good time to try and sell out and buy a bit cheaper and uh, you know they're 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 stuck in this very you know short term sort of mindset uh, and I'm often having to coach them back in that in that way of saying no th this is a long term thing think of it as minimum like absolute minimum is four years and really you should be thinking even longer than that um, but it's a common thing and I can understand when people are a little bit new and maybe they get a bit shaken and let's say they hear some bad news so. You know, was it easy for you and me, Dan? Did we just never have to deal with any bad news? <laughs> no, look, we all had bad news. I mean, I went through, okay, first of all, there's the Silk Road bust. That was a big deal. I mean, Bitcoin, I remember seeing that happen and big, seeing Bitcoin's price plummet. We had Mt. Gox shut down and Mt. Gox was 90% of trading volume. Put this in context, this would be like Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, Bitfinex, and Bitstamp all going down at the same time. You know, so I don't think people really, you know, when, when you look back, you're like, oh, it was obvious I should have bought Bitcoin when it was $10 or $100, but there was a lot more risk then. And there's a lot more stress and uncertainty. And dude, there was, there was no, there were literally no podcasts. There was no YouTube channels. There were a few articles. So there wasn't really a good way to reinforce the faith and belief in Bitcoin. Now we've got so much great content like this podcast and, and other friends I've got in the space. Uh, you know, I was just on Peter McCormick's and and we all, I think you guys produce such great content now and you've got, there's so many great thinkers. Um, you know, what's kind of funny, <laughs> it's kind of funny is I didn't consider myself a public speaker or a writer until two years ago. And I've, so this is a word of encouragement of saying that you, everyone is part of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's marketing machine. We can all help talk about Bitcoin in our own way, whether it be creating art, talking about it on podcast, creating a podcast or anything else. So, you know, for me, I, I just, it's been a wonderful explosion to see this, this content created to reinforce the belief of the hodlers. Before it was such a lonely experience where like there weren't that many of us, there weren't very many physical meetups and I lived in San Francisco and there wasn't a lot of great content. So when these traumatic or negative incidents occurred, there just wasn't a lot of like 
sounding board other than the pure faith you had, you know, in your own head uh, over, you know, being like confident and trusting that Bitcoin was going to bounce back. So we've never been in a better spot. I mean, fundamentally, like all the on-chain data looks phenomenal. Trading volume looks great. Public narrative is phenomenal. And then of course, the alignment of, you know, all of the content to reinforce the hodler belief, you know, it's never been a better time to be a hodler. Right. And I think that's one of the interesting points that you mentioned is sometimes bad news would happen. But then if you were following the space closely enough and and maybe you knew some insiders, people would look at things like, oh, actually, look at the hodl waves. There's like some real big coiling up of long-term demand or long-term hodlers. And, you know, what what might what might superficially seem like, oh, no, it's all over. If you talk to the insiders, they're all running to buy more. Like, I think a good example of this is March 2020, when Bitcoin yeah. crashed from whatever it was, nine, eight or 9,000 or something, down to maybe at the absolute bottom, around three or 4,000. All the hardcore inside people I knew were running to buy more at that time. But if you looked at an outsider, what were they doing? Yeah. I mean, you know, what was funny though, is, I mean, we didn't have memes like stacking stack sats and DCA, like those weren't even memes. Memes. It was mainly just hodl because <laughs> it was, because so, it was so volatile and there wasn't enough content to like help reinforce that faith. Hodl was just like, you're, you're sort of like, just, just hold the line. We're just going to hold the line and survive. Um, and now it's just, a, I think it's a much more positive, much more, I think, proactive narrative of DCA by the dip, you know, all those, all those sort of memes that I think, you know, these, these are so much fun too. these, these sort of narratives and these memes, these rallying cries. I mean, this is, this is the modern day equivalent of like a battle cry, right? Is, is hodl or, or by the dip or uh, stack sats. It's, it's really fun. Of course. And I think the other element that can come, and many listeners may, may be in this position now, obviously, as we are now, you know, current price around 44,000 as we speak, many of them would have bought far cheaper than this. What's the incentive now and why should they continue hodling rather than spending some of that down? Yeah, great question. So um, when I think about how I approach my own Bitcoin hodl, there, there's no right or right, wrong way to do it. I think a wrong way would be to actively day trade, but there's no like if you if you hodl for a long time, you know, and, and I'm a very vocal anti spend your Bitcoin sort of person, <laughs> I think uh, got quite the reputation around me being vehemently against spending your coin. What I'm vehemently against is you spending your coin on something trivial, like a Spotify per- a subscription, just because you can. If you want to use Bitcoin, immutability properties to buy something that's illegal or something, congratulations, you've used Bitcoin as it's intended. Or if you want to store value in it, take it and then have your purchasing power increase and then take some of that out later, that's fine too, but do it for something important. So look, I want to hodl my coins as, for as long as I can and never sell any. That's that's my objective. However, I am a human being after all, and, and I will need to eventually you know eat and sleep somewhere. So I have to come up with some method and we'll cover that a little bit later, <laughs> maybe around like the lend- lending and borrowing. Inside of. What do you mean? You don't just live in a cardboard <laughs> box? I, li- I live on the blockchain. I live inside the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, when there's life events, everyone's got partners that may or may not be as invested as they are in Bitcoin. You, you know, you can die a lonely existence with all your coins, but eventually you probably need to spend them on something important. A uh, son or daughter's wedding, a uh, house, a car, wh- whatever it may be. And that's what I meant that by there's no wrong or right way to do it. Everyone has a life event where they might need to take some money off the table to feel comfortable, to sleep better, to buy something they've always wanted. I think it's always measured, right? There's no, there's no black and white version of this. Now, would I ever sell anything close to like half or anything close to a majority of my coins? Never. I would never, I could never ever live with that. Um, and and to, be, to be frank, by the way, I, um, for me, like taking money off the table um, on a personal level, like I've been in eight years, right? So for me, my investment thesis was Bitcoin is gold 2.0. And we are just now touching upon that. And I would consider a hundred thousand to a half a million dollars a coin as having partially realized that objective. Um, and for me, I'm not going to look at taking money off the table necessarily. It's more of like, and that's why, you know, and that's why I'm so into lending and borrowing. I currently have an unchained capital loan where I borrow dollars against my Bitcoin as collateral. I do expect those interest rates to go down over time because it's a bit high to service and that's not any fault on their part. But then on the lending side, I get, I've gotten a lot of criticism for that too. But I'm like, guys, I've hodled for eight years. <laughs> I don't want to spin my coin and I'm willing to risk them to earn that yield. And that's a, that's a subjective journey that everyone has to think through. And I'm not going to hard chill it here. But that's the the reason why I do it is I hodled a long time and I'd rather 
better not sell them and I'm willing to take the risk. And my dream is what if I'd never had to sell my Bitcoin ever and I could just live off of the interest or borrow against it. And as I borrow against it, the dollars I borrowed, those drop in value and my Bitcoin increases in value, which makes the loan very serviceable. So to each their own, I don't think there's any shame in a Bitcoiner selling their coin at some moment. Again, you have to live, you know, you have to have a life. You, there's moments when, and especially with partners, I know whether you're a man or woman, you know, your other partner may not be as convicted or obsessed as you are in Bitcoin. And, uh, you, you know, that's just a fact of life. And, and that's going to be a fact for a lot of things. You may not be into what they're into as well. So there's, there's, don't feel shame if you have to. I think there's a lot of ways that I've been thinking through to mitigate the moment when I have to sell my coin for a life event where I can be a little bit more creative. So that's why I've been really obsessed on the yield side, the borrowing side. Just I'm, I'm trying to th figure out every way I can not to sell my coins, but to also live a decent life. Of course. I mean, uh, we don't live forever. Um, so ultimately, it is a balancing act between, you know, hodling as hard and long as you possibly can so that you can accumulate wealth and pass that on to your children and so on. Um, but then also, you know, you you have to live and you have to live somewhere and you have to, you know, and you also don't want to go the other way of sometimes you hear those stories of people and this is in the more normal, you know, personal finance world, you hear these stories of people who work so hard and they save their whole lives and then they retire at, you know, 60 or 65 or whatever. And then unfortunately, they, they passed away six months later and they never got the chance to actually enjoy that wealth. And so, you know, it, it's, it's ultimately it is a balance. Um, but as you rightly point out, I think there are ways that you can minimize the impact and try to push off the, you know, selling down of coins or the use of those spending of those coins uh, into the future. And I think that whole loan idea, now disclosure, uh, Unchained Capital and also HODL HODL Lend are, you know, they're sponsors of my show. Um, but I think it is interesting and important to discuss those as options. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how did you go about researching that idea of using the Unchained loan and, you know, why was that uh, an option you pursued? Yeah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> and yeah, so with Unchained, what you can do is you can borrow dollars against your Bitcoin as collateral. And uh, I began my journey, I think, around October, November, twenty nineteen, with this loan. So I'll give you the, uh, the the emotional swings of it. So for those who are thinking about doing it, it's not all easy. And uh, there's certain moments when you want to jump off a bridge, and there's certain moments when you feel like you're a genius. So okay. Uh, you want to borrow dollars against your Bitcoin for two reasons. One is you need the dollars to fund something in the real world, buy a home, buy a car, pay for groceries, or you want to go levered with your coin. Well, that's what I did. I, <laughs> I took the dollars and I bought more Bitcoin. So I'm actually over 100% of my net worth in Bitcoin, um, which I, <laughs> I've been a little bit reluctant to mention just because people already think I'm nuts at 100%, but I'm like, well, I'm, 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 over, I'm over 100%. So I bought more Bitcoin with it. So I took out an Unchained Capital loan. Bitcoin price at the time was around $7,000 a coin. So I took out this loan, uh, very over collateralized. I looked at the Never Look Back price. Uh, it was built, I forget who built it. I use that as a rough approximation for my max LTV calculation. So I'm like, okay, what's like based on historical drawdowns, what's the max pain I can endure before I get margin called? What a margin call is, is if the loan's value becomes such a large portion of the collateral, the lender gets worried that you're not going to be able to pay it back. And that's why they have the collateral. So they have to sell part of your collateral to pay down that uh, pay down that loan balance to make to put your uh, loan back in a, at a better LTV ratio. So so uh, everything was fine and dandy for a while <clears throat> until March 12th. <laughs> yeah. March 12th, 2020, we had the liquidity crunch and Bitcoin went down to 3,800. I had, I had over collateralized my loan in such a way that I was safe. But I know a couple of their friends that day that called me and they were in a panic. Um, and I, I was even in a panic too, because I'm like, shit, well, the value of my collateral keeps dropping and I can't wire in money to pay off the loan because I'd rather just do that at that point. Um, and if, you know, if it wicks down to like a thousand dollars just for a minute, I could be liquidated even about if it bounces back ju in just a minute. Um, so that was a really scary moment, <clears throat> a moment that I'll never forget. Uh, it's a moment, <laughs> I don't think anyone else is probably gonna experience something like that again. I doubt we see that again happen in Bitcoin, but um, you know, that was a, that was a, the whole world was panicking around COVID and there was a liquidity crunch. I, again, I don't think we ever see that moment happen again, but certainly it, it speaks to the fact that like you should appropriately structure your loan to value ratio. So for example, you can post like, <clears throat> you know, I think at a minimum, it's like 2X the amount of collateral versus the loan's value. You might want to do 3X or 4X. I even went higher than that, you know? So it was, you know, it was a moment to where like, it, it gets pretty scary when that, that happens. So I think like structuring the LTV is critical when you're thinking about borrowing. 
the second part of this, is, there's three parts. So it would be the LTV ratio, be the and then interest. How much are you paying to service this loan? With Unchained Capital and most other lenders in the space, it's quite high, between five and 10%. I believe long-term, these rates will likely go down to be between one to 2%. If we look at, uh, if you look at like margin on traditional brokerages, interactive brokers, you can get 75 bips if you borrow over, I think a quarter million dollars against your equities as collateral. So I don't see why Bitcoin wouldn't have the same sort of structure, especially given that Bitcoin is a pristine piece of collateral. So uh, long-term, I think these interest rates will go down significantly, which will, I think, fuel this, um, you know, fuel what Pierre Rochard has been saying all along, the speculative attack against the dollar and other fiats, as we just all borrow fiat and we have Bitcoin as our asset and collateral. Um, so interest rate's an important one. It's a, it's really hard to get a, really, a lower interest rate. Places that offer you a lower interest rate, and this goes into my third pillar, if they offer you a lower interest rate, what they're doing is they're rehypothecating the collateral. So for example, uh, BlockFi does this with your collateral. So they'll take out your collateral and then lend that collateral out. Now, this is advantageous for the borrower because now you pay 5% interest rate instead of 10. Um, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I personally don't do that. That's why I went with Unchained and I pay basically double the interest rate. Um, Unchained Capital does not rehypothecate your Bitcoin. Uh, and you can actually see the address where your Bitcoin are stored, uh, which is really cool. It is way more expensive. It's basically double the servicing rate. Again, I do that because I understand the risk I'm taking there, um, much more so than the risk I'm taking with like a, a BlockFi where um, they're taking out the collateral and lending it and I don't know who they're lending it to. I'm not saying that like, you know, one that, that one company is better than another, it's just a different type of risk. So when it comes to borrowing against your coin, keep in mind, you've got LTV, so make sure it's well collateralized. The The servicing of the debt isn't, you know, depends on your loan size, but it could be pretty material. So make sure you can pay that interest rate. And then finally, you need to make the decision between uh, rehypothecated and, um, you know, not rehypothecated. Right, of course. And I think a few interesting considerations that I'm thinking about there, you want to, obviously, it depends how many coins you've got and so on. Um, but I think an important consideration also is that you want to try, if you can, you want to do it only with a small percentage of your stack rather than like trying to lever up with a huge amount of your stack. So that way, if you needed to re, you know, put additional Bitcoin in to not get liquidated, then you can more easily do that. And you're not risking like a big part of your stack, if you will. Um, and also, I understand, I understand that uh, recently Unchained Capital are looking to change that collateral requirement. So I think now if you start up a loan, I think it'll be at a 250%. Um, I think partly spurred by what happened in March. So there are a few uh, things around that. And then I guess you've also generally, you would need to have income to be able to service that interest. So I guess those are probably some of the main considerations, right? Totally. And, you know, think about it too. Like if you don't structure this, this properly, they, they will have to sell your Bitcoin to pay the loan. And that could be a very traumatic moment. And I think, Stefan, you brought up a great point around size. Don't risk your whole stack. Unchained capital still could be hacked, right? They hold your Bitcoin as collateral, but what if they have an issue? Or what if the government seizes the coin? There can still be issues with uh, the non-rehypothecated method. For any of these, whether you lend or borrow, never, ever, ever use your whole stack. I think that's just really risky. You should always have some portion of your your coin, of course, you know, given that you understand private key management correctly, almost all of your coins should be self-custodied at all times. Um, when you do lending or borrowing, you are giving up the, the custodian or the custodialship of your coins. So, you know, keep that in mind about this, that I would never risk anything to, you know, I wouldn't do half or um, I wouldn't do anything. You know, I wouldn't even do half. I, I wouldn't do a majority of your coins. I <clears throat> do it with something, you know, this is the, <laughs> this is also the way I think about my own private key management. Have a blend of, of custodial and non-custodial enough to where it's a trust gradient of yourself. <laughs> if you are completely trusting in your own self-custody method, fantastic that you should do full self-custody. If you're not, have a gradient of where you put coins in terms of custodians versus non-custodial <clears throat> environments, so much so that you're not going to jump off a bridge if one or the other um, messes up. I have been around for eight years. Most Bitcoiners coins I know that have been um, lost or due to poor private key management on a custodial, on a self-custody basis. Now, I very much encourage people to do self-custody. I'm just saying it's not necessarily a binary thing where we <clears throat> we want to push people to do it until they're ready. Just make sure whatever sort of lending, borrowing, private key management structure you have, I would never put it all in one. Uh, we Even with the, your own private key management setup, I would never put all my coins in one private key management setup. Um, so I think that applies as well to the custodial arrangements too. You'd never put all of your coins into uh, Unchained Capital Loan or, or at all into BlockFi lending. Um, you know, be smart about it. Like do whatever you need to do to make sure that if something Something tr like catastrophic happens, you're going to be, you know, uh, <laughs> in a survivable mental state.
Yeah, of course. And I think someone thinking might someone listening might be thinking, oh, why do all this stuff? Like, what's the benefit really? But I think the main benefit in this case is you are pushing off the actual moment in which you have to spend those coins down or sell those coins down. And if you do that, you can maintain your exposure to Bitcoin, right? So ultimately, you know, historically, Bitcoin is doing, you know, over 200% per year on a like a CAGA cumulo, cumulative, you know, annualized growth rate basis. Like if you talk about like the last 10 years or so. Um, so so I think it's depending on the maths and how it would otherwise work out, if you had to sell and pay capital gains tax on that and all those kinds of considerations, that's where I guess the benefit comes in because you're pushing off the spending of coin into, you know, one year, two years, three years into the future. And then potentially there's also that option around rolling that loan forward. And so, you know... It, if you were yeah. to do it now and then the price has gone up and then you roll the loan, that's another whole way of pushing off the loan, uh, pushing off the sale. So long as you can fund the interest and you're comfortable with the percentage that you're um, putting in there, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. You can you can continue to roll these loans going forward. You don't have to necessarily close them out or not. Um, for example, like I have a two-year term. Let's say at the end of two years, I wanted to do another two years. They would just roll that into another two-year loan. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, yeah, you're right. So the, the primary function here is either to borrow dollars to utilize it for some pressing need or to go levered to uh, buy more coin. Um, either way is a good way to do this. And we're, what we're avoiding is that capital gains, uh, rec- you know, we're, we're avoiding the sale of our Bitcoin. So we're avoiding the the fear, the FOMO of a, of a bull run if the price continued to go up. Um, and also where we're, it's a tax advantageous structure where when you borrow against your coin, there's not a taxable gains event. So the IRS isn't like, oh, you sold your coin, you owe us taxes. This is a loan. There's actually something really interesting too. Now you need to consult a, a tax uh, attorney or CPA on this, as I am not a reg- uh, as I am not a financial advisor. But in the U.S., if you borrow against an asset and then use those proceeds to go invest in something else, sometimes that is considered, I think, investment interest, which is a tax which is tax deductible, which means that you can deduct the interest that you pay on the loan against your income, which is really cool. Right. So it's like a double whammy benefit then. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I guess, interesting considerations there because I guess it is coming back to that idea of, well, if you have a life event and maybe you need to, I guess, uh, buy a car to get around, or maybe you want to buy a house to, uh, you know, raise your family and things like that. But I guess even there, there are ways of really thinking through whether you absolutely have to spend that thing. And also even with, I mean, I don't know what you think, Dan, but um, I'm curious actually, because in Australia, it's like this huge property cult. It's a massive like oh everyone's got to buy property and it just to me seems like a huge huge bubble and everyone just kind of pumps their bags onto the next generation and so it just feels like as a millennial as you and I are it's like we're being very much encouraged to buy the property bags of um, people in the generations above us when that's not necessarily the most efficient way to tie up our capital I mean for from you and from our perspective it's better to be exposed to bitcoin and if you can oh yeah to rent oh man I I struggle with this a lot. Um, you know, for me, like every, like the, like the home as an investment is such a classic idea, both in Australia and the US. It's just, it's like a given. People go, you grow up, you find someone you love, you have kids, and then you buy a house. <laughs> That's just yeah. like, it's like, a, it's like a part of life almost. Um, and, and with Bitcoin, of course, after being orange pilled, you start to question everything, both nutrition, science guidelines, money, everything, right? And then when it comes to homes, I'm like, well, shit, you know, why would I buy a home? Home. <laughs> we've got also you've got some like population structural problems that I think indicate that you know I think like the period for buying a home might have been the peak periods were in the higher growth population areas where like now population growth is very much slowing across the world which means that you know if you've got a fixed supply of homes or an increasing supply of homes and demand stays the same or slightly decreases that's not exactly a great supply demand uh, model for that asset right like you've got with Bitcoin we've got 21 million and a massive amount of folks of demand that it hasn't come in yet. With property, we've got a ton of supply that people already live in and more supply coming. And if populations go flat, then that's not a great, great um, future for that. Now, so we've got that more negative side of the equation. You also have a lot of expenses with homes. You've got maintenance cost, insurance. Uh, you want to go refinish the kitchen because you want new cabinets or something. Homes aren't cheap. Um, and then on the on the more 
positive side, if you've got to pay rent, you're technically paying a margin over what that mortgage costs to the original home purchaser. So you're paying a little extra spread to live there uh, and not be mentally invested in owning it and paying the mortgage and whatnot. So you're not, there's no, there's no free lunch. You're still paying rent and you're still having to pay for it. Uh, and then also uh, the, a, a property is typically a, a good inflation hedge. So, you know, in a higher inflationary environment, gold, Bitcoin, and property would likely go up. So it's not exactly like, but the, here's the thing is it's the opportunity cost against Bitcoin. It, nothing compares. <laughs> exactly. And it, it's just it's perpetual. I, I just can't get it out of my head and it drives me nuts because I just can't, I can't think of any other way to do it other than just to keep hodling Bitcoin and borrow and lend against it. Right. Like I, I, I just don't see an alternative. Um, you know, it's something too, to where like, you know, when I was younger, when I was 13, 14, that was like my dream, right. Buy a, buy an apartment, especially, I mean, out here in San Francisco, a, a nice apartment is five to $8 million, um, you know, which is a, an incredibly massive amount of, of money. Um, but you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a little what a lot of people feel like, like they've made it is like the home, right. The apartment, the home, the beautiful home. Um, so I get it. it. It's something I mentally struggle with. I, I rent, by the way, I rent in San Francisco. Um, and I will be, um, by the way, I'm moving to Austin. Nice. Uh, I'm moving to Austin in a couple months and we'll be renting there. So I haven't made up my mind yet. I don't want to sell my coins also, but the idea of servicing like a, an interest only loan against my Bitcoin at like 10%, that's really expensive <laughs> um, because mortgage, also mortgages are tax advantaged. So you can write off the mortgage interest. So the interest you pay on in your mortgage is tax deductible. Typically it depends on the geo that you're in. Again, consult the tax professional. Um, that and the interest rates are super low. It's like two or three percent or something now. It's insane. So properties have been like artificially pumped up as this investment because governments have given crazy sort of awesome incentive packages to buy homes. They they allow the like deductible interest payments. They allow um, the rates are really low. And then there's other crazy shit where like I think in the U.S. it depends on I think this is a federal mandate or federal like IRS guidance. I think a certain amount of capital gains appreciation in your home is tax free. So they've they've essentially created a massive bubble in the home market by having these crazy tax advantage structures for home buyers because you know after the 19 after the 1940s and after World War II it was like well let's go let's go build America get a home have babies and go work nine to five and um, yeah I, I I definitely feel like Bitcoin has made me deeply question the idea of ever owning a home um, it, it's something I struggle with especially uh, over the last couple of months as you know I'm in my 30s and eventually want to start a family and stuff and I'm like well a home you know seems like a good idea but then I'm like well I, I don't know if I want to borrow that much against my Bitcoin as collateral and then I'm also like I don't know if I <laughs> I don't want to sell any of my coins so I struggle with it quite a bit. Back to the show in a moment. Coinkite.com are the creators of my favorite Bitcoin hardware wallet, the cold card. So if you are thinking about your Bitcoin security, check this wallet out. You can use it in an air-gapped way, meaning you never plug it to a computer. You can plug it to the wall or to one of those phone power banks, or you can use the cold power. So then you initialize it and then you move that wallet over into Spectre Desktop or Electrum or Blue Wallet to do air-gapped transactions. So this is a very commonly recommended hardware wallet by Bitcoiners to Bitcoiners. It's got an address explorer on the device. You can use passphrases. There's anti-phishing words. There's all kinds of features. Go to coinkite.com and use the code Lavera to order yours. As number is going up, think about your security and backups with cyphersafe.io, producing metal backup seed products like the Cypher Wheel. They've also got a new product called the Bitcoin Recovery Tag. It specifically helps with recovery. So this is an extra stainless steel tag with info, just like the original wallet, gap limit, derivation types, and the scripts used. And there's, there's one for each of the major hardware wallet types, and you attach this to your seed word backup with a stainless steel cable. And it's also got a website for recovery to help you or your heirs with recovering the coins on Electrum. So it actually adds that value of helping you or your heirs recover in practice. So go and check them out at cyphersafe.io and use the code Levera for a discount. Lend at HODL HODL is a global Bitcoin-backed lending platform and you can lend and borrow anonymously on your own terms. Now this is a peer-to-peer -peer solution using a unique multi-signature escrow for each deal. So if you have stable coins, you can put up offers and loan those out and earn interest on your stable coins. On the other hand, if you have Bitcoin and you need liquidity, either you know for a life event or you want to lever up and buy more Bitcoin, you can now borrow stable coins and keep on hodling in the sense that you didn't sell bitcoins. So with HODL HODL's Lend platform, you set the terms, you set the offers, you can go and check them out at lend.hodlhodl.com. Now back to the show. 
Yeah, I think it, these are questions that probably many Bitcoin Bitcoin Bitcoiners are thinking about. And I would say we have to also consider what's capital efficient, right? So if you want to tie up a lot of your capital into homes, then you're less exposed to Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is just going up so much faster. It's like you know you don't you're not you want to minimize um, holding that property shitcoin. <laughs> no, nah, look, I mean it's yeah, it's a, it's a property shitcoin. <laughs> And well, Bitcoin is like the only asset you really own, Bitcoin and gold, because it's an asset that you like custody of the asset gives you ownership. Like when you own your home, you don't really own the home. You own the title to the home that the local government enforces that can take it away from you at a whim. So that's, I think, particularly scary as well. Like after having held Bitcoin, I'm like, I love this thing. This thing is incredible. Like, oh, and with stocks, as we saw with Robinhood, you know, the T plus two settlement time, you don't actually like, you don't actually, the brokerage owns the stock. You just have a claim over it with your brokerage you know so it's a homes are kind of the same thing you you technically own the home and you have title to the home but that title is enforced by the local region and that's kind of a scary proposition too yeah. And I think the other thing that really comes to my mind is the sovereign individual thesis, right? It's like, you know, people if people try and look for a better deal, whether that's in another state or in another country even, um, and try to play that geo arbitrage game of, you know, everyone, every, a lot of people are working remote anyway. So why not, you know, try and uh, get a better deal for yourselves and for your family if you can, if it's available to you. Uh, that's also something that plays on my mind as well. I mean, and look, in fairness, it's not like we can all just live in a cardboard box. Like, have to live somewhere um and one of the main i guess concerns would also be around well okay if i rent i can't do as much with the property and maybe th there's the risk of being evicted and i mean these are things you have to think through but i guess for many people you know renting has been a better option if that allowed you to maximize your exposure to bitcoin Totally. Yeah. It's very case dependent. You know, I hope the takeaway here isn't that like I'm saying never buy a home. I'm saying I don't know if I want to or not. And I still haven't made up my mind. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's really tough. I mean, look, the perfect the perfect scenario. Here's the perfect scenario. Bitcoin keeps going up for forever. I borrow dollars against it and I buy all sorts of real world assets that I need for various things, buy a home, buy a car, and Bitcoin just keeps going up in price and the loan becomes easier to service. You know, so that's my dream. Well, but there's a lot of price volatility in between and that's where it all comes back to the LTV ratios. If you don't have that properly structured, you could have a really catastrophic event where you got to part with your precious Bitcoin at a price a lot lower than you were willing to sell them at. Yeah, I think those that's a really nice way to summarize it. And I think just more broadly, as our Bitcoiner thesis is essentially that many other assets are very overvalued. And so it's kind of like, why do you want to buy the asset that's overvalued? You want to wait until it comes down and it's more devalued and kind of brought back to brought back to earth in some sense. And then that is what enables you to then, you know, like theoretically after most of the gains have come, let's say post hyper Bitcoinization. Now, I don't know, people can't necessarily wait that long, but um, you know, you've got, you've just got to manage that process as best you can and push it off um, because you really don't want to miss out on those gains. Um, and I think it might be a good point to talk a little bit about, you know, prior mistakes that you maybe, not, you don't have to talk about your own stuff, but you know, what you've heard about out there when people were spending coins early and what were some of the mistakes that you saw around spending early? early. Yeah, I mean, so I was around during the time of the payments narrative that was really persistent and, and pervasive due to the amount of fundraising on the Silicon Valley side. To, you know, you couldn't raise money to be like, yeah, we're going to overthrow <clears throat> a global store of wealth of gold and <laughs> of, of <laughs> gold and dollars. And and VCs are like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like that's <laughs> that wasn't going to that, that, that pitch doesn't fly. But disrupting PayPal, that's a lot easier to fundraise on. So in thirteen fourteen, that's what a lot of the companies in this space fundraised on, and we were out trying to like make. That at work, right? At like blockchain.com. I built the first merchant app, um, the kind of like a merchant payment, like a POS terminal. And we would go, you know, try to get people to use it. I mean, I was there with Roger at different dinners, man. I mean, I was there for a lot of dinners out in York where the headquarters is at <clears throat> um, and trying to see him convince different merchants to accept Bitcoin. And yeah, I mean, look, the whole payments thing, like don't spend your Bitcoin on something trivial just because it's it's kind of fun and you're like, cool, I, I quote unquote used it. It's most, it's highest utility is in a very hard to seize store of value asset and it's immutability. Immutability means sending it or doing a transaction that would otherwise be prohibited. That's why it's useful. Use it for those two things. Um, using it for like a trivial payment, I think just kind of like, it, it's just a, a really great way to literally throw your coins away. And the folks that go say, oh, well, just spend and replace. Cool. Well, now you've just incurred capital gains. So you've actually, it's a very expensive transaction, both on now you owe taxes on that. Plus, uh, whenever you buy back, you now have to pay BIPs on the exchange to buy it. And you've 
you've also paid a transaction fee. So you're like, you're like, it's like little razor blade cuts to your stack um, just to support some trivial idea of like, this is using Bitcoin. Um, if you need to use Bitcoin for large values that you need to send to pay contractors or pay business deals or move money or buy big assets, that makes sense. If that's the only way that you can, you can do that versus using fiat. Again, Bitcoin's value prop is store of value and immutable uh, in terms of like the immutable transactions. So um, my word of caution would just be like, just don't do it for, look, I did a bunch of trivial stuff. Like, <laughs> oh man, I mean, all sorts of things. Um, I bought certain things that, you know, cost like a dozen coins sort of <laughs> sort yeah. of costs where I'm just like, there was even a hundred Bitcoin transaction one time where I'm like, oh man, um, I found an old wallet dat file. Every Bitcoiner does this in the bull run. They go, they start going through all their old uh, computers, trying to find like an old wallet dat file or, a, <laughs> or an old, <laughs> an old password or something. And I found an old wallet dat file and I'm like, ooh, all right, this, this could get interesting. And I opened it and I somehow I guessed the password and I was like, oh, all right, this is getting really fun. And then I saw the transaction log and I was like, no. Oh, man. Oh, man. Brutal. Yeah. So, you know, it, look, like every Bitcoiner I know has always regretted spending their coin. Always. I, I you know, you'll find a couple of people on Twitter that go, oh, I thought it was fun. Nah, dude, they're definitely cringing in the closet, worried about like thinking about how much they've wasted on it, or they're using that as a coping mechanism. You get the, the most, you get the best investment ever in human history in terms of price appreciation. <laughs> of course, you're going to live with regret when you spend it. So look, if you need to spend it on the car, that home you've always wanted, again, those are big lifestyle sort of changes that I encourage you to just explore deeply while you're doing it, but don't feel guilty doing that. Just don't spend it on like a Starbucks or spend it on a Spotify. It just doesn't make any sense to do that. Yeah, yeah. And a common thing that I notice in some people is, uh, what's that saying? It's like idle hands are the devil's play thing, right? It's like people just feel like they have to do something with their yeah. Bitcoin. When the simplest, and it's like, it's like in their minds, they, they think, can it really be that simple? Like literally just buy it and secure it and hodl it. And that, can it really be that simple? Don't touch it. <laughs> It's that's actually really freaking hard to do is not touch it because there's always things you want to go buy with it. There's always reasons why you might want to panic sell or FOMO buy or trade or there's a new crypto asset that you became enamored with. and You want to trade Bitcoin for it because you think you can time the market or you think it's going to flip in Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, I think that, yeah, it just it, it's kind of funny. There's a I think I forget what the exact story is, but there's a story about how what the end of the kind of like the end of work will be and the end of work. What it'll be is there's a computer and a machine or machines that do everything. And then there's a there's a human sitting there to fix the machines, but then there's also a dog. And the dog is there to keep the human from touching the machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's the end of work. You know, once we automate everything with robots, that's the end of work. But with Bitcoin and hodling, it's kind of the same thing. Like, just don't touch it. Keep your human emotions away from the Bitcoin. As long as you can do that, as long as you can divorce your human emotions away from the Bitcoin, the larger your stack will be, the more, the more purchasing power you're going to have and the better, you know, potential future lifestyle you may be able to live. Right. And one more tip that I can think of now is if you make, if you can, this is a James Clear Atomic Habits inspired idea, but it's if you want to discourage a behavior in advance, why don't you make it hard for yourself to do that? So in this example, if you can make it hard for yourself to spend, so for example, if you have a multi-sig setup and you've got the keys distributed in you know different locations where if you were to spend a large amount of coin, you would have to go to those locations and make it hard for yourself to spend. So that is another example where you can you know make it easy to huddle by making it hard to spend. I think that's a that's a great idea. I love James Clear, by the way. His uh, Atomic Habits Habits is a great book for folks who haven't heard about it. I recommend reading it. Um, yeah, you know, it, look, we're all humans at the end of the day. We have these animal urges, and we just need to understand that we're going to have those, and you need to plan around them. I think that's the TLDR of of these hab habit building formulas. Is you're like, okay, I know <laughs> it's just like you want that that cupcake or that cake, right? It's bad for you, but you're like, well, maybe if I work out and then I reward myself with it, that's a better way than just like saying no cake at all. Um, you know, so all sorts of ways to deal with these urges that we have. I definitely think making it an onerous process is key. If you just have it sitting on exchange, it's very tempting where you can just go click the sell or buy button. Um, you know, I think that's a really dangerous place to hold it just because of the temptation. You know, you're at the, um, you know, the, you're at the place where you can go trade it to anything else you'd like, including fiat. And that's a, that's a temptation that you probably don't want to have. So definitely private key management in terms of like having a rigorous setup makes it, makes the process a little bit more onerous to where you, you know, it's, it's a, it's just gonna be a lot more difficult for you to, <laughs> to, to give into those urges. 
Right, and uh, an example is maybe you're regularly stacking and then you're stacking it into that uh, cold storage setup and you are, in essence, clearing it out of your personal... Like you might, as an example, have a warm wallet that you receive coins into um, because maybe you get paid in Bitcoin or whatever um, and then you need to periodically flush that out into your cold storage, which is the one where it's hard to spend from. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I think that's a great way to think about it too. I definitely think about it from like a savings and checking account perspective or hot and cold wallet, kind of the same thing cold wallet is like your checking your uh, savings account hot wallet's kind of like your checking account so if you've got new coins coming in um heaven forbid you're spending the coins but let's say you want to spend the coins to the hot wallet's a little bit more flexible for you to be able to to uh, send coins out of there uh, and be able to access those coins in a timely fashion um yeah i definitely think like private key management is both like a combination of like resisting your temptations structuring it to where you don't have catastrophic risk either by yourself or by a third-party custodian and as well just like having like a sliding scale of like accessibility um um, you know, for example, with my Unchained Capital loan, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to act based on my private key management structure. I wasn't going to be able to access my additional collateral to post for the loan if the value kept dropping. <laughs> so that was right. So that's a scary moment when you go, okay, well, my private key management also needs to take into effect of accessibility if I've got a situation where I need liquidity immediately. I mean, that situation I had not planned for. Now, granted, I think it's a very rare situation, but I mean, that's something to think about if you've got like one of these collateralized loans is, well, you've got this cold storage setup, you know, you've got extra coins sitting aside just in case, you know, because you like to do self, uh, self custody. But, you know, if that unchained capital loan, if it gets close to the margin call, you might need to go access that to deposit more Bitcoin as collateral. If that's in a really remote spot, that's hard to get to. You could be in a, in a rough situation, which I faced in that moment. Um, so yeah, it, 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 private key management and, and hodling coins is a simple function of just hodling, but the, the method of doing it is a, quite a bit more complicated. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good point you made there that if you are going to enter into a uh, loan arrangement, now you have to think about being able to quickly access coins if that were to ever happen. And then how would you deposit more coins in? So I guess you're right there. Whereas if the person is just doing a very simple, like no leverage, no loans, no nothing, literally just hodling, just, you know, that's where they, it makes sense to make it really inaccessible uh, in some sense, right? Obviously, you still want to spend them someday. You still want to have them available to you, right? You don't want to like, you know, not think about it at all and like never Never even check the check the storage and check things. Um, but I, I guess yeah, that's that's an uh, interesting and important consideration there. Um, so in terms of things, other things that might cause us to dishodle, probably narratives and like how what's the what's going on in the media, what's going on in the world. Um, so as we speak today, it's February 2021, and it looks like you know we're on top of the world, and all these companies are running in to buy Bitcoin, and probably there's going to be a whole bunch more coming in. But what are some of the narratives that you see coming? Over over the next, call it, you know, one year or so that might cause people to dishodel. Yeah, well, let's talk about some that already happened. Man, Tether FUD has gotten really, you know, got really intense there for a couple of weeks. Lots of Tether FUD, right? Um, and that's where I view, I view my role. I actually started writing, by the way, because I got so annoyed with the FUD around that Bitcoin, uh, that Bitcoin hodlers weren't, have, like that only devs mattered and that hodlers didn't matter. Naval Ravikant said that back in 2018 and I got so triggered by it. That's what started me to write. But that's what, that was the moment. <laughs> that's where the first article I ever wrote was hodlers of the revolutionaries because I was like, this is fucking bullshit. Like yeah. hodlers played incredible important part. I can't believe this misinformation exists. I then wrote proof of work is efficient and other articles because I just got so triggered by these narratives where I'm like, these are ridiculous. Um, where I'm like, I view myself as a FUD buster. It's kind of a fun way to do it. There's a bunch of us. We all we all do it. Yeah, of course. You, and I know Nick, Nick Carter is a legendary FUD buster. <laughs> yeah, He's yeah. A, very, a very eloquent one too. Um, and yeah, so we've seen over the last month, uh, the Tether FUD and proof of work is wasteful FUD. Those have been the two predominant FUD narratives. These ones are easily debunked and are immaterial. So I don't really consider them a, a big issue. FUD, it's important to fight FUD and bust FUD because if you let FUD spiral out of control and if people's aggregate opinion about Bitcoin changes, it, it's reflexive. So like Bitcoin's price goes up and people have more faith in it and people trust in it and people don't believe in the FUD. If the FUD leads to a downward spiral in price and downward spiral and everything else, then if you, the only way to kill Bitcoin is if you make everyone stop believing in it, right? And FUD is, a, is not an additive function to the belief, it's a detractive function from belief. So fighting FUD, I think, fights and protects Bitcoin. That's why I do it. Also, I'm a little bit argumentative, so it's kind of fun. Um, and uh, so, yeah, when it comes to those two pieces of FUD, you know, I put out some content with my newsletter to cover some of those. The Tether ones was something I hadn't tackled previously. So I, I just wanted to go about that one content 
comprehensively. The future FUD that we're going to hear about, um, one will be, uh, which is silly to see this one, but like Janet Yellen said like, oh, we need to look at cryptocurrencies because they're used in money laundering and drugs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That, that was, that's a very old piece of FUD, but I've got a feeling we're going to have to fight it again. Luckily, we're going to have companies like Tesla, MicroStrategy, and, and tons of huge um, macro traders on our side this time. So it should be a lot easier versus a niche group of nerds, you know, was, which is what we were. So Bitcoin's FUD fighters or FUD busters, are, it's a much louder voice, much more pedigreed voice this time around. But I would, I would suspect that one we have to fight again. We're going to have to fight around Bitcoin's fairness. I'm assuming that narrative will kind of, that one's pretty quiet. Almost no one ever brings that up. But I assume if Bitcoin hits 100,000 to a couple hundred thousand market cap or price per coin, that's going to start to creep up a little bit. Uh, that typically happens at the peak of the cycles. Uh, people get um, kind of uh, jealous of Bitcoin hodlers returns. That one was one we'll probably need to touch. Um, I would say the money laundering and drugs falls under control as well. Control will be a big narrative. And that's, I guess you could label that as like regulation. Bitcoin's already highly regulated. It's one of the most regulated assets out there. Um, on chain, of course, it's not, but the on and off ramps into it are. Yeah. I mean, it's in the US, it's regulated by the CFTC, FinCEN, SEC, um, it, literally like every alphabet soup agency you can imagine. So Bitcoin, you know, people, I think the regulatory side were fine there, but if they try to increase regulations there, I think that's a narrative we'll have to fight of like, oh, is it, will Bitcoin be choked to death sort of narrative. Um, and then I think the big one that is more protocol based is privacy. And I see this one looming on, on the horizon. I, I view it as somewhat already, it's already a kind of a done deal. I don't really see the the um, rationality of the other side's opinion in this regard, but there's a, a hypothetical setup here where you have the more pro-privacy folks for the Bitcoin blockchain and the pro-privacy, but not as pro-privacy as the most private, private folks. But super private folks might want to add things like confidential transactions on layer one or things that would obfuscate, uh, greatly obfuscate transactions on layer one. Problem with that is that, that there's a trade-off between the auditability of Bitcoin's monetary uh, policy, so the 21 million hard cap, and the privacy. So there's there's it, it, it it's not, an, you can't have both. So you can either be fully private and not as auditable or audit, fully auditable and not as private. I believe largely the Bitcoin community has sided with, we'll have auditable because the 21 million hard cap is, is entirely how this, entirely the value prop and how this all works. Um, and then we will push privacy to either like layer two or improvements with like coin joins and schnorr and, and incremental improvements on layer one. So I see the privacy battle coming up. I don't think it's going to be like the Bcash hard fork one. Um, it's not nearly as contentious. It's not nearly as divided. I think there's some folks who kind of reminisce or wax poetically as to what they wish Bitcoin would be, which is they want it to be their private e-cash, which is also what the cypherpunks really felt about cryptocurrency, what it should be. Um, hence why some of these folks built Zcash and Monero and whatnot. There's not really, I don't really see a reason why Bitcoin would change anything on layer one to accommodate this application type uh, as Bitcoin using CoinJoin plus layer two tech is private enough. Right. And I think it's, it remains to be seen. Maybe there's some advance in technology coming over the next five to 10 years. And maybe it's a longer term thing that we do get something that improves privacy. And it's just, we don't know it yet, or we don't have that technology available to us. And the current technology gives, you know, doesn't have the right trade-offs that we would accept. And maybe in, the, in that time, maybe there would be something that does give better privacy without the risk of inflation and, you know, without, you know, um, risking the auditability, who knows. Um, but yeah, I guess the other point there is that there there may exist to be these two different worlds, right? The kind of regulated world and the kind of more gray market, non-regulated world of Bitcoin. And they will just, for better or worse, they'll just coexist. And uh, it seems to me that like that's the likely outcome, at least for now. Um, and it seems that the borders between those two worlds are quite porous, right? That you can just, people can buy coins on a regulated exchange, run them through a coin join and send them out and now they're out into the yep. gray market world. Yep. Yeah. I mean, look, um, coin joins work so well that most darknet markets, most merchants and, and transactors use Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, that's that's testament to its value. Now, you know, with coin joins, it's going to be really tricky once layer one fees start to get pretty high. I would estimate layer one fees probably between $50 and $100 um, by the peak of this cycle, which uh, is not a bad thing. It's what we've all been predicting and is inherent with how Bitcoin's been architected. Um, and it's definitely not a bad thing given it's a store of value protocol where the values being moved are very large. Cargo 
ships, not containers, as Nick Carter puts it. So, but with coin joins, that might be a little bit cost prohibitive. It depends on that. Like maybe then it would just become like you can only coin join very large values. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this. I defer to folks that are a lot smarter than I am, like Matt O'Dell and those guys to, to jam on, on how Bitcoin works with coin joins in a high fee environment. Um, but yeah, I, I think like Bitcoin has great privacy already. It's got pretty good privacy, um, all puns intended. You know, it's uh, it's not perfect. I think like, and that's where I pushed back on, I wrote a, a piece on privacy. And I pushed back on the idea that, you know, that perfect privacy is possible. I've seen the internal mechanisms of how data is collected at like an Uber scale. There is no way to escape data collection unless you do not have a cell phone and you live off the grid in an internet connection. And so if you've got a cell phone, you're registering tons of metadata with the cell phone towers, with GPS, like you've got all sorts of apps that have SDKs that are recording this data. So the idea that like you can have a perfectly private transactional protocol, like let's say, let's say hypothetically Monero Zcash is that, which they're not, you still have a huge amount of exposure with all the metadata you're throwing off. Have you ever checked the price of Monero on your phone? Boom, logged. Have you ever, have you ever, okay, you did a, uh, you did an in-person transaction for some coin to private, buy it privately. Well, if that person's been flagged as a dealer, then they're, they're checking all of the text messages and, and metadata messages. Like people forget like, like, oh, well you might have encrypted messages, but the metadata actually gives more information than the messages themselves. In fact, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the US government drops bombs on SIM cards, not people. It looks at the connectivity between that SIM card and other SIM cards. It doesn't even need to know the message. It just needs to know that this SIM card is communicating with these other SIM cards and that identifies them enough. So when it comes to perfect privacy, perfect privacy is not possible on a practical level for 99.99999% of people. So having a perfectly private protocol is a bit of a pipe dream because even if you could accomplish that, which can't, you still wouldn't be able to preserve the other privacy measures, which would leak a bunch of data too. Right. So there's a lot of difficulty around achieving that that dream of you know fully open source and uh, secure and more private. But I guess it's not stopping people taking certain incremental steps, right? They can take little incremental steps um, and hopefully longer term things can be built out that, for example, uh, alternative phone operating systems or things that are, you know, like graphene and so on and Copperhead and Calyx and things like that on the phone. And then, you know, potentially over time, um, that is an option for people. But certainly for now, it's it's very, very difficult and just not feasible for the for the app, not at all feasible for the average person. Um, but, you know, hopefully as number goes up, we can uh, see funding into some of these projects that help um, give people back uh, their sovereignty and freedom. Oh, yeah. Oh, to be clear, I'm a huge fan of these projects. I love stuff that's like really out there, like using ham radio uh, to transmit a Bitcoin transaction. That shit's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm down to like be as... <laughs> as you know resilient as possible i i just zoom out to like the more i you know i'm my my content is typically more geared towards the the average person so i'm just thinking more of the average person's vibe um, but i very much encourage and would encourage everyone to go down the rabbit hole of, of increasing their privacy as much as they can um let's put it this way though like are you running a mobile vpn on your phone right now <laughs> yeah so i normally run well I, I often have tour running but no not a vpn on my phone no yeah Exactly. Exactly. I've got it on my phone, but I, I turn it off once in a while because it slows down my internet speed. Yeah, it might slow things down or the battery. And again, there's always trade-offs with these things, right? Because you can say, yeah, just use these things, but then it might burn your battery faster or you might have connectivity issues when you're trying to connect into things. And But I mean, it, I guess it depends what you what we're talking about because if I'm using Samurai Wallet, that is using Tor. So it's kind of, it really depends on what, um, you know, what you're talking about. And maybe you can selectively flip it on when you need to do, when you need to look things up or whatever. Um, so I guess there, there are ways to manage that. Um, but uh, look, Dan, it's been great chatting with you, of course. We've got to um, get the listeners to subscribe to you. So where can they find you online? Yeah, well, I had a blast. I think we need to do this more often. I, I feel like we could have talked for a couple more hours. There's a lot of things to cover <laughs> when it comes to a Bitcoin hodler. And there's so much things, so many things happen in that. I mean, it's just it's just wild to live in this time. And I think just take a moment, by the way, if you're listening to this, to enjoy the fact that you're part of this and part of history. Like uh, you will, we will only go through so many of these bull runs. Enjoy the moment. I know it feels really intense, but just kind of take a moment to reflect in it. Um, you know, for myself, if you really liked what you heard today and you want to follow me, I'm Dan Held on Twitter. Uh, I've also started a newsletter called The Held Report. Report. And so if you search for it, it's on my, it's on the bio on my Twitter account or just Google search Dan Held Substack. That's where I cover kind of my latest, more long form thoughts on Twitter. I'm a growth guy. So I optimize my tweet for maximum propag uh, propagation, which means I got to make it kind of short, quippy to the point, which I like doing that. But sometimes I've got deeper thoughts I want to share <laughs> more than, more than just a couple lines. So that's what I do. And then my longer form newsletter comes out weekly and I write about longer form topics. For example, like um, last week or a couple weeks ago, I wrote 
wrote about the, the rebellion begins, which is about um, how Wall Street bets is more of like a mindset and how that you know is accretive to Bitcoin's narrative of of being this rebellion against the existing financial system. You know how longer longer term there's a shelling point behind Bitcoin rebellious narrative. And then this week I'm writing about uh, Bitcoin being incorporated into treasuries of big companies and what that means, and then also what what does that mean for like the you know for those who've read um, um, some of like William Gibson's books and uh, you've seen movies like. Uh, aliens or um, um, you know some of these uh, these different movies that kind of talk about mega corporations I weave that into this where I weave in what is the future of Bitcoin and how it enables a mega corporation a mega corporation is a corporation that's like larger than governments and so I think uh, Tesla buying Bitcoin kind of signaled that which is really cool um, so yeah uh, oh by the way it's in the sovereign individual in the sovereign individual they bring up ideas like this that people and companies start to be able to shop and go around different uh, jurisdictions so that these are the type of topics that I cover. Um, so yeah, check it out. I mentioned it a little bit earlier if you want to rewind uh, where you can go find that. You know, Thanks, Stefan, for having me on. Um, had a blast and looking forward to the next time. Excellent. Thanks very much, Dan. All right. I hope you found that useful in terms of Bitcoin hodl mindsets and Bitcoin finances. Of course, if you are going to do that stuff, make sure you remain responsible and prudent um, and don't overextend yourselves. Definitely don't want to get wrecked on any of those kinds of things. And lastly, before we finish up, you might have seen on Twitter the Sailor Academy, which is a not-for-profit free education initiative by Michael Saylor, has created a Bitcoin for Everybody course. So Michael asked me to create that course, and it's a 12-hour course that is curated with nice materials from you know well-known people like VJ Boyapati and Parker Lewis and all, all kinds of people and Dan Held as well. So make sure you go and check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's great for if you are a, a newbie yourself or you want to go and tell your new coiner friends, this is a nice curated course that will take them through and teach them the basics on Bitcoin. So get the show notes at stefanlevera.com slash 251 and I will see you in the Citadels. 